The following is an Outdoor Channel original production. Powered by Ram Trucks, America's longest lasting pickups. A group of friends was supposed to be back from a trip to the Darby Ice Caves. Oh, they're not back yet. I want a fast team, a follow-up team with more gear, and a third team with big gear and a, and a backup. We were concerned that they're dying. Hey, guys! This thing starts flooding. Get up high. This may not be a good thing. Hey, guys, can you talk to us? Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the most exclusive destination in the Rockies. It's America's front door to the Tetons, where inspiring peaks and record-breaking big game are just part of the appeal. All that's appealing about Jackson is summed up in local real estate prices. They remain staggeringly high. Because of its natural beauty and limited private land, Jackson Hole is one of the most coveted real estate markets in the entire country. So putting down roots here means spending $2 million on a home that might go for $250,000 in other parts of Wyoming. For many who want to buck up and buy in, this is the man to see. Tim has owned a construction business since the 1970s building luxury homes for Jackson Hole's wealthiest residents. Ha! Ah, this is the fun one. It's gonna be really cool, a little house and a guest house. It was the joke of long time. The millionaires have, were chased out of town by the billionaires, and that was back in the 80s. And the net worth of some of these residents that come in here and build second homes and or first homes to stay here is pretty substantial. Tim's clients are demanding. So his work requires a fanatical eye for detail, a skill that makes him perfectly suited to his second life as the longtime chief advisor to Teton County Search and Rescue. I have to say I'm pretty type A and controlling. I've been incident commander a lot. I've been here a, a long time. The team just listens to me. I don't have, really have to say much. They, they be quiet, they listen to me, and we move on. Ready to go? Well, years ago, in 1992, in the fall, there was an ad in the paper for volunteers to apply to be on a search and rescue team. The person that was the leader of the team led for about two years, and then he moved up to become the under sheriff at the sheriff's department. And immediately, we realized we needed a leader because we were starting to have organizational issues and I went into his office and I said you know we need to have a leader and he says great you're it and um, once I was chosen I, I never looked back today Tim is on his way to be among old friends as he helps oversee a joint training exercise between SAR and two other rescue teams the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort Ski Patrol and Rangers with Grand Teton National Park the mission to practice patient evacuation from an exposed mountain ledge. I'm coordinating two ground rescue teams um, of search and rescue folks. We're putting everybody in the field now. The first order of business is to get our short haulers inserted near the snow border. 
The heli shuttles people and gear up to the training area. That's where volunteers Cody Lockhart and Dr. A.J. Wheeler walk ski patrol through the do's and don'ts of helicopter evacuations. I've, I haven't been told that I'm flying or not, okay? A.J., you're going out second flight out? Using a stretcher roped into what's called a short haul line that extends from the bottom of the heli. This simulates a real rescue, with Tim practicing his role as incident commander giving orders by radio. Hey, C1, IC, go ahead and make a plan and get back to me what your uh, mode of extraction is and let me know and um, what I need to do down here for your support. Um, we do have our patient uh, packaged in a suck bag and uh, at this point, I think uh, just a Bowman bag would work. The litter is the stretcher used to stabilize the patient and the Bowman bag wraps the person up in order to shield them from the wind and cold. The litter in the Bowman bag they basically have a sled attached to them, needing someone to grab a hold of them. I won't lose you. You comfy? Yep. Okay. Five zero. Five zero. Copy five zero. Then I say. The decision was made to short haul John and myself in with the litter to help extract the, the victim. It's standard procedure for the rescue team member to be harnessed with the patient during a short haul rescue. The team, made up of park rangers, ski patrollers, and SAR volunteers, executes a flawless extraction. Flying two crew members and a patient in the litter off the ridge top and down to the landing zone. Good job on that rescue, guys. Keep it safe. It was really good. Uh, well done. We'll see you down at the bottom. Teton County Search and Rescue often trains on Saturdays. And because weekends are when more people explore the backcountry, it's not uncommon for a training session to end with a call out for a real rescue. 911, where's your emergency? I'm calling to report that a group of friends was supposed to be back from a trip to the Darby Ice Caves, and they're not back yet. This time, the call comes in from Idaho, on the other side of the Tetons from where the team is winding down its ridgetop training. Not only is this rescue alert coming from the opposite side of the mountains, it's also in a place totally unlike where the team spent the day. When we get a call, a cave rescue, um, the urgency is extremely high there. So the issue is, what do we do with training? We need every single person here to get them out, so we need to go. Because this call is for three missing hikers who were last seen headed for the Darby Ice and Wind Caves, which means they could be lost underground. The scenarios are, they're just late and they're post tolling out, an avalanche is a likelihood, or they could be hurt. The hikers might be injured or suffering from hypothermia. So Tim leads the team to gather what it needs to race over the mountains where the road ends and a difficult trail into the backcountry begins. Um, hypothermia is a real threat, and that's what our ticking time bomb is, is if we can just get to these guys quick enough. Powered by Ram Trucks. America's longest lasting pickups. Teton County search and rescue veteran leader and volunteer Tim Seal Carlin takes over as incident commander, mobilizing the team to go in search of three hikers lost somewhere in the area of the Darby Ice and Wind Caves. They know about the cave. As you heard, they're in there chipping the ice plug. They're stuck or lost. The Darby Ice and Wind Caves are a one-way underground cavern system with an upper and lower entrance that sits on the western side of the Teton Crest. That means it's at the edge of SAR's reach and difficult to access. And the longer it takes to get there, the more threat there is to the hikers trapped inside. We get a call, a cave rescue, it's a really big deal. It's probably our worst case scenario. We're concerned that they're dying. The team relocates to the trailhead closest to the caves. Tim is in charge, and this is his command post. I want a fast team, a follow-up team with more gear, and a third team with big gear and a, and a backup. First thing we do in an incident, we establish the incident command, and then we put a game plan together within the first three or four minutes. And then we have operations, and operations are the folks that are really making the decisions what's gonna happen in the field. Forward operations are run by hasty teams, 
and guided by the best athletes and most skilled survivalists, including Jake Urban, owner-operator of the Jackson Hole Outdoor Leadership Institute. As a hasty team leader, my role was often making sure that the rest of the members on that team understand what the objectives of our mission are. But before Jake and the other volunteers head out, Tim gets an aerial surveillance report. Okay, team, go ahead. It looks to be evidence of a new slide south of Main Darby. Now Tim and the team must manage risk before they even get to the cave. But for Jake and the other first responders, risky challenges are part of the appeal. They feel ready for whatever this backcountry might throw at them. Everyone on this team is a volunteer. Uh, everybody knows what they've signed up for. As we progress up mountain, it goes from green grass to a little bit of snow, then a lot of snow. The Hasty team locates three sets of tracks headed toward the caves, and this leads them through a designated wilderness area. Well, wilderness areas are tough, a long way back from civilization. They have no roads. Gosh, wildlife, bear, terrain that nobody's really been into. I don't know, you know what you think if they actually did go to the ice cave. Hasty one copies that, and we'll continue on. And um, we find ourselves being detectives, trying to root out all the clues. Soon, the team reaches the first big clue, enabling them to eliminate a possible scenario. Doesn't he have your in reach? So this is their tracks. Oh, these right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right yeah. here, that's them. The tracks lead to the upper entrance of the cave system and not to the lower entrance. So the hikers probably avoided avalanche activity reported near the lower cave entrance by the aerial spotters. Instead, they apparently climbed further, headed for the upper ice cave entry point. This means the hikers could be attempting a demanding through hike of the caverns and might be stuck inside. So the team decides to split up. What do you guys think about trying to stay in these trees, seeing how it holds up in there? By entering through the lower exit, Jake's team hopes to take a shortcut to the lost hikers. All right, are you near or did you already go through the avalanche area? There is no avalanche uh, on this side of the canyon that would affect them. So we're pretty convinced that they're stuck in there at some point. Um, hypothermia is a real threat, and that's what our ticking time bomb is, is if we can just get to these guys quick enough. Inside the Darby Ice Cave, there is a serious route requiring six to 12 hours underground, where spelunkers navigate an area known as the maze. It's full of narrow paths and freezing water. And sometimes this route is blocked when the cave water freezes solid. That's what Tim is worrying about back down at Ensign Command. With any luck, we're gonna just do a little short little crawl here. But there's a, uh, typically an ice block that builds. A lot of folks don't realize that, so they will go in the ice cave and they work their way down, pull all their ropes off the other drops, and they can't get out. And that's exactly what Jake's team finds, a plug of rock hard ice blocking the way. Then through the ice, they spot lights and guess it's the hikers, trapped after a long cold night in the cave. All three could be succumbing to deadly hypothermia. That's his light. That's that's he's right. Hey guys! So yeah, turn off your light. After getting to the ice plug, the only way we were able to confirm that they were behind it was we could see light. Yeah, that's moving. He's right there. Yeah! Dude, that's his light. Is that coming from outside? Hello! We, we were to just, just, we can get this started. Just go to town. Watch the shrapnel in your eyes. Go for the high spot yeah, where the yeah. light's coming through. Jake has no way of knowing the thickness of the ice plug or how desperate a condition the hikers may be in yeah. on the other side. So check it out, they're flashing. Hey guys, can you hear us? I've seen this pretty thick before in years past. And this could be 20 to 30 foot thick. In extreme cases, hypothermia can kill in under an hour, with victims becoming delusional or spiraling into a state 
of hysteria. He's right. God! Hello! Backcountry Rescue is brought to you by the Ego Power Plus Lawnmower. Ego, power beyond belief. And by Polaris, the world leader in off-road. Visit Polaris.com. Hey guys, can you hear us? Hello? Deep inside the mountains outside Jackson, Wyoming, any place above 8,000 feet can feel like winter all year long. Just below Snowline, Incident Commander Tim Seal Carlin oversees a rescue inside the Darby Ice Cave. He has to decide if he should risk sending in another team from the upper cave entrance. There's ice falls in the cave, there's vertical shafts, there's water right up to your neck going through passages. It really is a challenge. It's like he's above us, and you can't really get up there. They're chopping on the same side we are. I can see their ash coming down. A thick ice plug blocks Jake and his team of first responders from making contact with three lost hikers trapped for more than 24 hours in this frigid underground wilderness. Life or death, it's always life or death up here. Jake leaves the cave to call Tim on the radio and discuss their options. There are places in the cave that if somebody's hurt, we can't put them on a backboard and we have no way to get them through some of the crawls. And we know we're going to be underground in damp, cold conditions, uh, right at freezing, 32 degrees, and some water up to our chest. And for 12 to 24 hours minimum, that's not a moment for me. Um, because it not only it's a long way to get there, but we have to find them, we have to get in there. Now we're, by the time we find somebody in the cave, we're wet and cold and tired. So they're really hesitant about sending a team through. Tim determines it would be too risky to send in the second team from the upper entrance. That route involves several dangerous rappels made extra perilous by the icy <laughs> conditions inside the cave. Tim believes his team has no choice. They must break through the ice. That's the problem, is that when there are ice plugs, we're never sure how, how wide they actually are. Sometimes they're pretty simple to chip through. Other times, it might take days to cut through it. Yeah. Go for the high spot yeah, where the height's point. coming through, oh, weak point, point. and just go to town. Hey guys, can you hear us? Once we began to break through the ice, water started to um, come out of it. This thing starts flooding. Get up high. This may not be a good thing. Backcountry Zero. A campaign to reduce fatalities in the backcountry. It's time to heighten our awareness about safety. It's time for Zero. Teton County Search and Rescue are chiseling away at a massive ice plug trying to reach three lost hikers. Hey guys, can you hear us? Anytime you're in a cave and water starts pulling in, it's not a very comfortable thought. Luckily, the meltwater passes, but it raises new questions about the condition of the lost hikers on the other side. Yo! Yo, yo! yo. Can you, can you see through this hole? Hey guys, can you talk to us? Finally, they chop open a porthole so that one of the rescuers can slide through. Hey, yeah! And they like what they find on the other side. What up, boys? My name's Mike. Ultimately, the party was uh, was safe, unhurt, albeit very cold, wet, and tired. Okay, so no medical. Yeah, food. We're, we're totally fine. Let's uh, let's start rolling, and uh, you guys all have lights. Go. Let's get yeah. two of us yeah. down there. All right, you got your feet. 
Now everyone hustles to get the chilly hikers out into the sunshine. Sun, if anything, it'll energize us. <laughs> uh, I, I would think that heat's gonna feel good. Oh, man. Glad you guys got us. <laughs> Put in our best folks. They went in there and they know the cave, they know how to, uh, high angle systems, and they know what to do in that environment. Uh, so beautiful. And the good part to rescue. When they reach the mouth of the cave, they radio the good news down to Tim. Good day. Jake is just naturally a good mountaineer and a good leader, and he, he was the right guy that day. I feel like in my, in my previous EMS work, I've saved lives, but the connection you make with people in this environment is unlike any other EMS opportunity that's out there. Together, Tim and his team savors moments like these. When training, attention to detail, and hard work pay off, and everyone goes home in one piece. <laughs>